absolutely. And I think the other side of talking about demand is talking about supply, right? And we're still um, dreadfully undersupplied. Um, no matter what it is that you look at, we're at nationally somewhere around 500,000 listings. Um, you know, you like to be at around 2 million, right? And that also has to do with what we call that mortgage rate lockdown. Uh, where a lot of sellers on the resale side are sort of locked into their house because of that low interest rate. So um, in fact, most of the sellers that we talk to are saying, well, I'm really sort of unwilling or unable to trade in my mortgage payment that's at 2% or 3% in favor for one that's double or even triple at 6 or 7%. Um, and so because of that, they're sort of staying put which means that those listings year over year are not growing. In fact, they're down, I think, 18% year over year in new resale listings. Um, and so because of that supply still being restricted, you know, new construction really offers the best amount of opportunity, um, you know, for buyers. Welcome to the Uncensored Real Estate Podcast, where nothing is off limits. If you're interested in buying, selling, or investing in real estate, and you want to learn some of the insider secrets and uncensored truths from the true professionals in and around real estate, you've come to the right place. Now, let's buckle up for the uncensored truth about real estate and join your host, Brian Cardenas. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us on the next episode of the Uncensored Real Estate Podcast, where nothing is off limits. And as usual, we like to bring in professionals that are in and around the real estate business to try to help educate you all on things that you probably don't know about the real estate business and uh, that you should in order to really make wise decisions related to your real estate purchases and investments and things like that. And today I wanted to uh, introduce you to a very special guest and, and friend of mine, Nicolette Chapman with Zonda. Nicolette, thank you for joining us today. And before I uh, hit, hit over, have, before I head over to you, I get tongue tied sometimes. Um, I want to remind you all to make sure that you uh, subscribe and like if you're watching this on YouTube and uh, subscribe if you're on your favorite podcast platform and give us a five star rating so we can keep on doing this and reach more people out there. So with that being said, Nicolette, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. My pleasure. So um Zonda, tell us who Zonda is and then give us a little bit of your background and kind of how you ended up where you are. And, and uh, that way people will know, hey, maybe we should listen to this uh, nice lady. <laughs> sure. Well, um, thanks for the nice introduction, calling me nice. Uh, that's always a good start. Okay. Um, yeah. So Zonda is um, essentially a data and consultancy firm that specializes in the new construction space. Um, where I sort of fit in is I run our mortgage, mortgage vertical nationally, um, where we really work to help lenders uncover opportunities to work with builders. Uh, we help um, lenders understand how to better navigate the market for their buyers so that they can understand um, you know, where they can sort of leverage, um, maybe it's seller concessions or if it's uh, builder incentives, um, in this case, um, you know, best ways to sort of be successful in the market. Um, interestingly enough, I came to Zonda having been a customer first, um, have spent the better part of uh, 22 years in the industry, um, most recently having been tasked with uh, starting a national builder division from the ground up and really leveraged everything that Zonda had in order to be able to do that quickly and scalably. And I joke that I did so uh, so aggressively that they actually recruited me to come over and run the platform for them at Zonda. So been here about three years now, a little over three years, and I love it. Um, obviously, there's no better place to work than a place where um, you're such an advocate for what it is that they do. Um, you know, it's it was an organic step for me. Yeah. I mean, using the product and seeing the benefits of it makes it really easy to step in and, and promote that to other people, I'm sure. Definitely. For sure. So you, your background, you've been in the, the title and escrow side of things. You've been in the mortgage side of things. Uh, you're a consumer. Um, so I'm going to ha have you put on your consumer hat with all that other knowledge that you've got there. And, um, Talk to me about what is the builder market like for consumers right now? Because, you know, people have 
options available that they didn't have like six months ago um, in the resale market, you know, with a, a, an already existing home. Tell us what that looks like right now. What is the market like for consumers with builders? So it is a great time to buy if you are looking to purchase new constructions for a couple of different reasons. Um, number one, and I want to start out by saying, I think, um, you know, there's so many buyers, you know, some statistics say up to 90, 95% of buyers who are actually just sort of on pause. They're sitting on the sideline waiting for rates to drop or waiting for sort of it to become more affordable. Um, my suggestion would be is that if you can swing it, leveraging, you know, builder incentives, which by the way, you know, 80% of builders that we surveyed last uh, month reported raising the incentives for their buyers. So if that means helping with closing costs, helping with uh, buying the rate down or paying off that mortgage insurance in order to make the numbers work. Um, builders are willing to do that. Um, but going back to my point about it being a really great time to buy, in addition to those wonderful incentives, is that you have bargaining power right now. Um, you're able to negotiate. Whereas if you go back to you know 2021 or early parts of 2022, when the market was just so unhealthy and so difficult in order to be able to get a, a contract accepted, um, you know, you have some flexibility now to call to say, no, I do want these concessions and I do want you to buy the rate down. Um, and so even though you are buying your initial house at a little bit of a higher rate, maybe high sixes, 7%, um, the fact is, is that you're getting a great deal on the house itself. And that way, when rates do go down, you're going to be in a great position to regain equity right away. Um, because trust me, those 95% of buyers that are sitting on the pie, on the sideline are all going to be back driving those prices back up, bidding wars and the things that we saw before. So um, get in now and then you can always refinance later. But obviously, each family situation is different. But I always say, if the only thing that is making you worried is the rate, you know, that is temporary. Right now is a great time to be able to negotiate a deal on a house. Yeah, I think that's really important for people to remember is that, well, there's there's just so much noise out there. It's, it's hard to remember this, but you hear all the doomsdayers, you know, the market's going to crash, you know, housing's going to go down by 30, 40%. And like, if you step back for a second and you think about where we were at the beginning of the year, where we are today, we're in a dramatically different place for one reason only, and that's rates. Absolutely. Like all of the other fundamentals that were there that were, were driving uh, demand, even prior to COVID, because COVID artificially inflated demand with ridiculously low interest rates. But before that, there was good solid demand because of demographics, because people need to get bigger houses or downsize all the normal things that happen in a real estate market. And the only thing that hit the brakes is rates went up, you know, doubled on everybody. And so just logically think about it when rates go back down, cause they're going to, what's going to happen? Like all of that pent up demand just doesn't evaporate and disappear. Like sure. it's going to come back and we're going to be back in a probably not as bad situation as we were in 2021. Cause we're not going to have rates as low as we did, but if we have low, you know, lower rates than we have now, um, they're going to come back, right? Absolutely. And I think the other side of talking about demand is talking about supply, right? And we're still um, dreadfully undersupplied. Um, no matter what it is that you look at, we're at nationally somewhere around 500,000 listings. Um, you know, you like to be at around 2 million, right? And that also has to do with what we call that mortgage rate lockdown, uh, where a lot of sellers on the resale side are sort of locked into their house because of that low interest rate. So um, in fact, most of the sellers that we talk to are saying, well, I'm really sort of unwilling or unable to trade in my mortgage payment that's at 2% or 3% in favor for one that's double or even triple at 6 or 7%. Um, and so because of that, they're sort of staying put, which means that those listings year over year are not growing. In fact, they're down, I think, 18% year over year in new resale listings. Um, and so because of that supply still being restricted, you know, new construction really offers the best 
amount of opportunity, um, you know, for buyers to go in and negotiate. And like I said, I mean, they're wonderful. You get a new house, you get to pick what you want, you get to have amazing infrastructure for work from home or, you know, internet can work for to support two Zoom rooms and your Peloton room and, you know, YouTube kids streaming in their bedrooms. Um, so there's a lot of wonderful things about buying new construction. Um, and like I said, builders right now are really eager to work with buyers and sort to make it to make the deal work. So I want to ask you about the, the supply issue that you brought up, because housing supply in general is still really, really, really low, like you mentioned. Um, and the only way out of that is new construction. Yep. Where are builders at with new construction? Because they're not exactly building enough houses or inclined to increase their production right now, are they? Yeah, you're right. You know, I think a lot of the inventory supply is actually, um, you know, not finished, right? So they're sort of slowing uh, their build. And for good reason, obviously. I mean, they have numbers to protect as well. They don't certainly want to be investing in building all of these homes. And if there's not enough buyers, they don't want to be stuck on that product, right? Um, but it brings up this sort of interesting yin and yang of tug and pull and, you know, how much is too much supply? Um, because the reality is, is we are still hugely undersupplied. And that goes back to, you know, the last housing crash, um, you know, that occurred in, you know, 2010. Um, builders just are still catching up with that. Yeah. And so what happened back then, just so that people understand, because we always hear about, you know, well, the market crashed back in 2008, 2009, you know, this, this is going to happen again, because there was a bubble then, there's a bubble now. And so they think that there's similarities. There really wasn't. Um, tell our, our listeners what housing supply looked like back then relative to the demand uh, that they had back then. Sure. You know, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but obviously, I mean, there were so many houses on the market. Um, and so really that is what causes a crash, right? But without oversupply, you're never going to have a crash. Um, it's just basic economics of supply and demand, right? When you have a lot of demand, then obviously it drives prices up. But um, you know, we're not oversupplied, which is what typically would drive prices down. Um, we're just sort of in this interesting, you know, like I said, mortgage rate lockdown where people are like, listen, I have equity in my house. I've got, you know, money in the bank. The financials are actually really good um, nationally. In fact, you know, that's why the Fed keeps having to raise rates, right, is because inflation is just still not really budging the way that we need it to. Um, the, the, the economy has been fairly, you know, strong still. Um, but I would say in terms of just supply, you know, that's why it's different. That's number one is we're just still hugely undersupplied. And again, it's when you've got massive supply that drives prices down. Um, but number two is we're talking about different types of loans. You know, when QM came out, we're talking about or qualified mortgages, the people that have these mortgages right now are actually people who are qualified buyers, right? We're not dealing with NEGAM loans or interest only loans or floods of adjustable rate mortgages. Um, you know, people are in a good position to be able to stay in their homes and they're not forced to sell. The people who are forced to sell for whatever reasons that some of that you mentioned earlier of maybe a divorce or growing a family or maybe a death in the family, like those are reasons that people are selling. But for the vast majority of people, you know, they're sort of deciding, well, time to fall in love with my house because I'm not going anywhere for any time being. Yeah. Yeah. And I think with, um, you know, the the supply and the demand imbalance that we have right now, we had a complete imbalance back in 2008, too. And it was just way oversupplied. I mean, it was actually, I think in 2005, if I'm not mistaken, was the highest number of new construction that we ever had in history. It was and wild. <laughs> prior, like right around that time. And just right after that, the new new household formations like dropped off a cliff. And yet new construction kept going up. And so it just it oversupplied homes. Like you mentioned, anybody could get a home practically. I would like to say, you know, if you could fog a mirror, you could get a, a, a loan back then. And it's definitely yeah, not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's not that way now. And uh, is there prospects for builders to be able to pick up the, the supply of homes that they're building? Because I know obviously with 
all the, the lockdowns and the supply chain difficulties, it was a challenge no matter how much they wanted to build. There was just a limit to capacity on what they could do. It feels like to me from not being in the industry that the, the limitation and constraints on the capacity has lessened, like they should be able to build more, but now with interest rate hikes, now they're nervous because of that. Like, are they looking far enough in advance to understand, hey, this is going to turn, whether it's in six months, 12 months, two years? Yeah, you know, there's, you know, they're sort of pausing a little bit, right? I mean, there's an intentional slowing, I think, of the actual build. Now, are they absolutely stopping? No. And in some markets, I mean, I would say the story is very different regionally. Um you know, in markets in the Southeast, um, you know, we are still seeing, you know, really, really low, low supply. Um, whereas in Phoenix, you know, that is one of the markets that actually has a higher amount of supply than some of the others across the country. Um, but overwhelmingly, we're just not seeing these this panic selling that I think a lot of people thought would occur um, and so, but going back to your point, um, you know, with new construction, you know, every builder is different in what their approach is. Some are more bullish than others, um, you know, but certainly your big builders, you know, they still have to sell homes. They are publicly owned companies and have numbers to report. So, you know, they are many times more willing to negotiate um, or, you know, bring a price down or make it really attractive, particularly if you're able to um, buy around the end of their fiscals, because uh, they've obviously want to make those major pushes in order to, uh, you know, get those numbers as strong as they can make them. Now, when a consumer is going out and considering um, buying a new build, um, what advice would you give them in terms of like starting their search? Should they go out there and start running around to different new build communities? Should they get in touch with a real estate agent? Like what's the best thing for them to do as a consumer? Yeah, you know, I think you work with a loan officer um, and a, um, a realtor that are familiar with new construction um, and make sure that you're represented. Um, I always say they're gonna negotiate the best that they can for you. Um, so I would say just make sure that you have a great team behind you um, as you go in and really sort of uncover um, what's available because every builder is different of what they're able to offer and what they're willing to offer. Um, and having a professional on your side, whether that's a real estate agent and a loan officer that are good at new construction, I think is really important before you just go in and start visiting, you know, new home communities. Yeah, I think the consumers sometimes they don't realize that um, and it's the same whether it's new construction or a resale home, like the buyer's representative is not paid by the buyer directly. I mean, the sellers and the builders are paying yeah. them. And they, they're, if they go into a community without a real estate agent, they have no representation. The sales representative there is representing the builder. They'll facilitate the process for them, but they're not saving themselves any money by not having a representative. Correct. It could actually cost them money, right? I mean, because you know exactly, you know, how to help them negotiate the best deal and what, you know, is actually available, um, you know, in order to make it more affordable for them. Yeah, and there wasn't, I mean, I guess the experience that people have had a year ago, there wasn't a whole lot of negotiating. Like <laughs> builders no, are in a position to say, no this is what it is, take it or leave it. Now <laughs> it's like, you get to negotiate, which is you. pretty unusual with builders. Yeah, it's a great, like so I said, it's a great time to go in there and, um, you know, make it strike a deal and knowing that that interest rate is really temporary. Um, you know, if you, again, if every situation's different, but if you can afford to buy right now, there are a lot of deals to be had. You want to buy a house, but high interest rates have got you down. Take the rate challenge and send us a verifiable loan estimate from another lender and we'll beat it and pay for your appraisal up to $600. Here at Give Mortgage, being powered by you Mortgage allows us to provide you with unmatched speed and efficiency and the best rates and fees in the market, all while delivering you the concierge level service you deserve. We want you to have an experience getting a mortgage that you'll never forget and not because you got put through a meat grinder to get it. At Give Mortgage, we give great advice we give the best rates and we give back to charity. Visit us at www.give-mortgage.com or call us at 
4684 to schedule a free consultation to see how we can help. Yeah, I think something that uh, the consumer doesn't realize either is, and let me back up for a second, back in 2020, 2021, if you went in and you got under contract on a new build, first of all, congratulations, that was not easy to do. <laughs> but then when you did get under contract, you know, they give you a target date, but that was fluid. Like you really had no idea when you were actually going to close. It could be, it usually wasn't faster than they told you, but it was usually longer than what they told you. And then what some builders started doing is they started putting in clauses into their contracts where they could adjust the price on you midstream, didn't they? You know, I've heard rumors of that happening. Um, none of the builders that I have had conversations with had done that. Um, but I'm sure it has existed. I mean, um, but again, that's why it's important to have someone representing you um, to help you understand the logistics and the risks that are associated with signing a contract. Yeah, I heard that from a few agents that were actually representing buyers and they would go through the contracts. And that's another thing for buyers to understand about builders contract versus a, a resale contract in whatever state you're in is the builders get to draft the contracts and the builders draft the contracts for the most part to protect themselves. Like they're not egregiously bad to where, you know, they're, they're not looking out for the buyers at all, but they're certainly weighted to the benefit of the builder. Whereas on the resale stuff, it's for the most part trying to be very equally balanced between buyer and seller. And the, the thing that we're situation we're in right now is you can be under contract and you could have been waiting for the last nine months to have your house built and you're, you know, 30, 60 days out. And, they may have some issues getting that loan done now at the current valuations with appraisers, right? What, what yeah. buyer? You know, I'm, I haven't had as much with appraisal issues yet um, in most markets as much as I have heard just um, DTI not working out because of interest rates having increased as much as they have. Um, you know, obviously appraisals are affected by any kind of concession. So whether you're putting into closing costs, um, you know, or otherwise, you know, that can affect uh, the, the actual appraisal as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, ultimately, I think with builders, they have a little bit more flexibility, I think, in terms of that appraisal than resale um, does because the comps can be all over the place. And whereas with your builders, like they're typically, um, you know, they do whatever they can for the most part, not to actually take base price lowerings just because to protect their other homeowners. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, the, the appraisal issue, I think we're, we're probably not yet experiencing that because, you know, we're just coming on the, probably in this market anyway, the last couple of months starting to see some price softening, you know, in the resale market, but appraisers still have the ability to look back a little farther than that. Although they should pick up the new ones that happen. I think if we see continued price softening, then we're yeah. going to start to see more issues with appraisals. Um, and that can impact uh, the new build world as well. Like you said, they have a little bit more ability to kind of protect prices, but they're also willing to move on prices too. They are. They are. Oh. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because the builders that we sort of talk to, you know, they'll say, well, if you reduce base price like $10,000, like the end impact to the consumer, it, it doesn't really wow them, right? They're not like, oh, okay, well, you you lowered a $380,000 house to three seventy. dollars Like that doesn't really mean much to that consumer. But if you give them $10,000 towards their closing costs, or you give them $10,000 to buy the rate down or to pay off the MI up front or some of the other things they're doing in order to save money. And then that's a direct translation into saving $300 a month, right? Those are things that builders are seeing be much more impactful and meaningful, which is also why as for a consumer, you want to make sure that you're working with a loan officer that is really creative in helping structure the deal so that it is the makes the most sense for you as a buyer. Yeah, it's a really good point because I think that uh, people don't, it's hard to conceptualize or feel the impact of the big dollar amounts, you know, like really what is the difference, like you said, of $10,000 or $20,000 on a price of a house? It's just, we boil our, our, our life down to what does it cost me on a monthly basis? Like how do I have to cover my bills and what is that going to be? And, and like you said, 
um, the impact of like a, a rate buy down is substantially higher on the monthly payment than it is on the price of the house. So I think um, if the consumer is under contract on a new build, and like I mentioned before, you're getting to the end of it, and now the market dynamics are different. You know, maybe you're, you you guys didn't do a lock in of your interest rate when you should have. You know, early on. Now it's getting way more expensive. They can still renegotiate the numbers with the builder, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, you are under contract. Um, so, you know, there is a certain element of the builder can say no, in which case you and you walk away, you're going to lose your earnest money. I mean, that's the reality of it. But that's any contract, right? I mean, you can ha absolutely have a discussion of renegotiation. But whether or not that builder chooses to renegotiate is really their prerogative. Sure. Now, I don't, I don't know if you get into this too much in terms of the actual language of the, the builder contract. Is that anything that you, you get into very much in your scope? Not so much, not on my side of it. We more really sort of dive into analytics in terms of, you know, um, builder incentives and, you know, how much inventory is available, what, you know, lenders are sort of out there capturing market share where there might be opportunity. So yeah, we actually more look at the total landscape more than the semantics of a contract. So I, I guess the, the question um, that I would ask you then with that is, what is the the price point that you see probably the the largest amount of building happening in going forward? Like if we can project out the next year or two, because I think it, correct me if I'm wrong. I think we started to get to higher price points being uh, more of the market for new build. And it feels like we need to be at lower price points, yeah, uh, entry level homes to really try to help out with the, the supply and demand imbalance. Sure. So I think what the builders were doing at the time was really sort of reading the appetite of the market with interest rates being as cheap as they were, they could certainly afford to build more expensive homes, right? People were able to afford them. But according to uh, National Mortgage News, an article that came out um, in the last two weeks, they talked about the fact that the most um, prolific pool with the highest amount of growth is that first time home buyer space. They actually had a 50% increase of total market share of the buyer pool, um, you know, this year. So what we look at is there is a need for affordable housing, um, move up buyers, are not really the big pool right now. Why? Because we go back to them being tied to that two to 3% interest rate that they're in in their current house. So they're not really looking to move up. Um, although I will say there's certainly um, an element of wealth that plays into effect where you've got your move up buyers, which are sort of still sitting, but definitely, um, you know, your true wealth top tier buyers are definitely still building and buying, you know, those multi-million dollar homes. Yeah. A lot of those are just cash. So interest rates yeah. don't really impact them. It's, <laughs> it's a lot easier to making more money on all their money now. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and the, the, the whole dynamic that, that gets lost in the conversation a lot of times with just the general consumer is, you know, people are typically um, better off on the income side of things now than they have been in the last couple of years. I mean, the increases in, in income, I think I saw a stat around if somebody changes a job, they're they're typically getting about a 16% increase in their pay. If they stay in their, their same job, I think it was in the 7 to 9% range uh, of increase in pay. And so that it helps um, accommodate a little bit of a higher payment based on those higher interest rates. But like for improving the, the supply and demand imbalance, if you've got a move up buyer, um, you're not really doing anything for supply and demand. I mean, they're they're selling a house, they're buying another one. It's it's a wash, and the first time home buyers, which are the ones that pretty much got locked out of getting into a house in the last two and a half years, now is their chance because of the decrease in competition. And it, when they go buy a house, they're not giving one back into the market, you know, by selling something. So they're taking another one away from the the supply problem. So we're kind of back in the same situation that we were in. And I guess I'm just curious to know, like, how far ahead are builders planning? Because obviously to go acquire a piece of land, get all the permits and everything done, and then actual startup construction, I mean, there's a pretty long runway from the time that they decide to go make an investment in a plot of land. 
before they can actually deliver deliver product to the consumer. So yeah. how far out? Like it, that's what surprises me about their reactions to interest rates today, because if they're going to contemplate you know starting a new project. I mean, they got to be thinking probably three to five years down oh, the road. Yeah, they're always acquiring land. I mean, listen, the reality is is that um, you know entitlements can be a decades long process, right? So, um, but the reality is, is you've always got to be purchasing land because there's so much that goes into getting it ready to be developed. Um, by the time that you actually are able to pour a slab, I mean, that process is, can be, like I said, I mean, 10, 15 years, not always, but especially wow. in cities, depending on, you know, their process. And, you know, we also know that, um, you know, transparency through internet has obviously changed a lot. So neighbors and, you know, will come up and sort of protest these new neighborhoods. And you've got cities that are saying our streets can't handle it. And now we actually have to get approval for, you know, to widen streets before they'll actually approve, um, you know, further development or we need to build another school here. So there's all of these things that happen before a builder can just go in and start, you know, um, building a house uh, or a project. Uh, so I would say, yes, builders are always buying land. Now, the difference is, is like now that that land is available and it's ready, we have vacant develop lots that we are, you know, approved to be able to start building on, but how quickly do we want to start building on them in this particular market? So we do have a lot of vacant developed lot supply that is available, but I will say that I think the sort of general food for thought or sort of thought process on it would be, you know, let's sort of make sure that we're not going to be stuck with a lot of quick move in inventory um, because the appetite of the market just isn't there yet. So one of the trends that, that we started to see last year, and tell me if it's if it stopped or continued, is builders building uh, to rent out uh, homes instead of to sell. Is that something that- Still there. Continues? Yeah, it's still there. It's still there. Our company definitely um, works with several builders in that space, um, and there is definitely a market for it. Remember, it all goes back to supply, right? So we're still undersupplied. And we still have a big population. People need shelter, right? So whether if the market's tough right now for people to be able to buy, well, then they're going to need a place to rent, right? So that's the reality is, um, you know, build for rent is still alive and well and um, something that many organizations continue to invest in. So I think a, a potential... Um you know, real estate investor, not on that scale, but just an individual that's thinking about buying some investment properties. Like I just had somebody back out of a purchase of a, a townhouse in a very affordable price range uh, because between the start of the contract and, you know, the end of the escrow, which was only like 30 days, started kind of freaking out about the market. And, you know, I don't like this idea, uh, the interest rate, I can't, I can't take this interest rate, you know, and I just said, well, you know, you're going to be renting this out, right? Like we have a housing supply problem. Like if people can't afford to buy, which is kind of what you're expressing concern about buying at a certain interest rate, they're going to have to rent, right? Like so, right. I mean, they're going to have to be somewhere. Yeah. So, isn't it a good time still to buy investment properties for real estate investors? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I think it'll. I, I, I tend to hesitate a little bit because I say it's yes, it's a great time, but I also want to have some um, sort of understanding um, for people who maybe just feel like it's too tight. You know, I would say don't overextend yourself. If you can't cover it, if you don't have a renter for X, Y, Z, or they don't pay the rent because something happens in the economy, you know, make sure that you're putting yourself in a place to succeed. If you can and you're and you've got enough of a cushion back there, it's a great time to be able, you know, to uh, still have a property to rent out for sure. You, you've been trained by the attorneys well, huh? You've got all those disclaimers <laughs> built in there. <laughs> no, I do. I have them. Um, I do. I always say it depends on the individual and even with it, buyers too. Like I said, I mean, if you can swing it and it makes sense, you know, it's a great time to buy. You can get some great deals out there right now. Yeah. No, I mean, you're, you're, you're right. hundred percent. I mean, you can't put yourself in a position where it's going to be a bad situation. We never want to do that. 
I think the thing that I try to remind people of is, and in this particular person's situation, there was plenty of uh, cash flow. <laughs> there, was, yeah. there was really no uh, fundamental reason to back out other than just fear. And that's where, to me, it's like, don't let fear paralyze you. Absolutely. you know, look at the numbers. If the numbers make sense, you know, if the cash flow is going to be good or if your personal cash flow is solid and you've got, um, you know, a job or a business that is going to still have a need no matter what happens in the economy, like factor all that stuff in, of course. Right. And when you do factor it all in and all the numbers and everything makes sense, like, it's a great, right. It's a great place. I mean, it's a great investment. I mean, I think we look at historically speaking in real estate. Um, you know, I remember back in the crash with in 2000, you know, 10 and everyone was like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm getting rid of this house because it's never going to be worth what I paid for it. Right. Oh, and yeah. now we're 10 years later and those houses that people said, you know, oh, it's 700,000, it's worth 400,000 today, are now worth 1.2 million, right? So I think ultimately real estate historically has been a really good investment for the long-term play. Um, you know, I think you always want to look as well at what your long-term, short-term goals are. Um, you know, if you're looking to maybe flip a house in the next, you know, 30 to 60 days, I would question of whether that a good idea. That would make me afraid. Right. <laughs> but I think, you know, if you're looking at an investment property or a second home, I mean, like I said, I mean, these historically are outstanding investments, um, especially when we know the stock market's been a little bit touch and go. So um, if you do have money to invest, I think, like I said, in the long term, um, historically speaking, real estate is a great investment. Yeah. I mean, lately, the stock market has been mostly go. Not, not <laughs> like go run away from it. Yeah. Um, yeah. One, other, one last thing I want to touch on though, with related to the the builder side of things, is um, speaking of all of the concessions and accommodations and things that are available. Um, one of the things that we've always had clients have a hard time with is these um, concessions that builders will give if the buyers use their selected title company or their selected lender. Um, tell us a little bit more about is that. Is that stance that they take softening up? I mean, is there the ability for buyers still to get those and use their preferred um, lender usually? Because I don't think they care too much about the title company, to be honest. Yeah. Well, actually, it's interesting. The title company, actually, are the, they're the one that they don't usually want to give up on, um, mostly because it involves the closing, right? I mean, they yeah. want, it's pretty cut and dry. You know, they tend to not want to move title companies. Um, but on the lender side of it, um, we're definitely seeing um, a lot more flexibility. I would, I think the last number was somewhere between 47 and 52% of um, all builders out there had an incentive that was directly tied to their preferred lender, which means that half of them don't. So I would use that as part of your leverage um, as your sort of discussing, well, can I use my lender? Because there are other builders out there that don't require me to use a preferred lender. Um, but certainly, I think, um, you know, builders are willing uh, to sort of listen, um, you know, much, I would say at a higher rate than what they typically would, especially the big ones that have their own mortgage company. Yeah. And that's something that you have to look at the numbers. And we would we would do the same thing, you know, because you don't always get the best deal from the builder's lender. I mean, you typically don't is the right. truth of it. But if they're giving you, you know, $10,000, you know, even somebody like us as a broker who we can typically get better rates than most of those mortgage companies, $10,000 is $10,000, you know, and it's sometimes very difficult to overcome. And so um, having the right representation, like you were talking about before, I think is really critical because if you've got a real estate agent who's working on your behalf and they can really help to drive that, negotiation, you're going to have an easier time of protecting yourself. Cause I've, I've had realtors tell me in the past where, you know, they have the, I actually had it um, where buyer was using the builder's lender, using the builder's title company, et cetera, et cetera. And I had one agent that told me where they had such a, a increase in the base price of the model that they were building over the time that they were in construction, that when they got to the end of it, somehow, some way this qualified buyer, no longer was qualified, not necessarily for a hundred percent le legit reason. 
and the builder was happy to let him go and refund his earnest deposit because now they could turn around and sell that property at a much higher right. price. And he had really no no recourse because he had all of his eggs in one basket. Um, and I had a, a guy, I think it was in 2020, same kind of thing. And his his financing was a little more challenging situation, but he kept pushing the builder and kept pushing the builder on you know, finishing the project and, and um, just little things. He was in construction, so he was being really nitpicky about everything. And they just finally got to the point where they said, we're done. Like you can go on your way uh, here. Here's your loan denial. You know, surprisingly, the, the loan denial showed up. So they were justifying the way to get, you know, wash their hands of him. And that's where we try to tell people like, yeah, you got to look at the numbers. You can't just blindly go with your lender if you're giving up, you know, $10,000 or $5,000, but also know the risks that you take when you do put all of your eggs in one basket and, and the builder holds control over everything. Yeah. And there are a lot of um, builders as well that will say like, if, because the builder's loan, a builder's mortgage company typically doesn't have as much flexibility or range in those loan programs that are available. Um, so, you know, many times in those cases, a builder might say, okay, well, you've been declined by our mortgage company, but if you go to someone that we can recommend, then we'll still, you know, release those incentives for you if they can get it done. So every builder is different and every mortgage company is different. I always encourage people to really, especially when talking to builders, don't be afraid to reach out, um, you know, to another loan officer um, who is, you know, familiar with doing new construction because um, many times they'll be able to negotiate better on your behalf, get you a lower rate, um, and sometimes even still have the builder be able to give you that incentive money in addition to, you know, lowering that rate. Yeah, I think it's a really good um, piece of advice that, that we've been talking about a lot is for the consumer to understand that um, even though the process is, is set up to be very, um, systematic and like you come in, you get under contract, you work with their salesperson, you use their people and you, you finish up as it was, everything is negotiable at this point. So, yeah. you know, everything can be on the table, make sure that you find the people who can help you out and look out for your interests. Don't assume that any seller, whether it's a builder or a, a traditional seller is looking out for your interests. You've got to be in charge of things. You've got to have the right people on your team. And um, and then, you know, negotiate the best deal for yourself. Absolutely. And I would say that's key to what we're dealing with in this particular market is don't be afraid for, to ask for things. Right. Um, because certainly builders want to be able to still build homes and move product and, um, you know, keep housing is such an important part of our economy as well. So we want to keep sure keep things moving the best that we can. So don't be afraid, uh, you know, to negotiate. Great message to finish up on. Well, I wanted to thank you again very much for joining us here today, Nicolette. Thanks for having me. It was great to catch up. Yeah, for sure. So thank you guys for joining us again on the Uncensored Real Estate Podcast. Make sure that you, again, subscribe and check back with us next week for the next episode. Everybody, take care. Thanks very much. Thanks for joining us and please remember to go and subscribe, like, share, you know, all that cool stuff to help us grow and come back to listen to our next episode. Until then, go out and live life uncensored. Thanks for listening to the Uncensored Real Estate Podcast. Don't forget to help us out and subscribe. Follow and give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast platform. And check us out on YouTube for the full video podcast. If you want more information on any of the topics discussed on today's episode, email us at uncensoredrealestatepodcast at gmail.com or give the Cardenas Mortgage Team a call at 480-331-4684.